Most people are familiar with the U-2 spy plane and the 1960 incident involving the Soviet shooting one down. However, what's not as well known is that the CIA had only given the U-2 a useful lifespan of about two years. So what do they do? Continue using it, improve upon it, or build an entirely new aircraft? Well, actually all the above. As soon as the U-2 took flight, the CIA got to work on another aircraft, the A-12. With it requiring new specifications, a new suit would also be needed, one that could maximize the efficiency of the craft while also keeping the pilot safe and somewhat comfortable. That would come in the form of the S-901 series of fully pressurized suits. Now before we dive into covering the suits of the Lockheed A-12, we just want to let everyone know this video is a part of a collaboration with the channel Pilot Photog. For those of you coming over from there, welcome, and to those who aren't, you should take a look at Tog's video covering the development, history, and usage of the actual A-12, link to which can be found above, in the description, as well as at the end. Okay, so let's get right into it. It's the 1950s and quite a number of partial pressure suits have already been fielded for various projects and aircrafts with a series of full pressurized suits beginning to sprout up come the middle of the decade for naval use. Now the difference between these two are pretty straightforward. Partial pressure suits will protect certain parts of the wearer's body up to a certain altitude. Its main way of attaining this is by compressing the body, thus keeping the wearer under a specific pressure. This was considered by many as uncomfortable, but made up for it by way of being smaller and easier to maneuver in. A fully pressurized suit, on the other hand, essentially covers the wearer entirely and encompasses them in the proper atmospheric pressure. So, even at great heights, their body remains in a safer and more comfortable level, which in turn can even protect them from cabin depressurization. The downside to these, though, was that they were a little trickier to move around in, were heavier, and took up a bit more space. With the early years of the U-2 seeing partial pressure suits being employed, many felt that doing the same with Oxcart, the code name for the A-12's development project, would suffice. This was so much so that the initial the proposal presented by Lockheed to the Joint CIA and Air Force Selection Committee suggested doing so. However, with the A-12 having the goal of flying 3 miles, or 4.8 kilometers higher, as well as 5 times faster than the U-2, there were a number of factors that called for a full pressurized suit. One of the biggest was temperature. With the plane flying so high and at such great speeds, the heat of the cockpit itself could reach above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or around 37.8 Celsius. Many involved with the physiological aspects of pilots and aircraft such as this pointed this out as one of the best reasons why a pressurized suit would be required. Even still, there were those who pushed for a partial suit, but regardless, the Firewell Corporation, along with the David Clark Company, which had been subcontracted by them, were hired to design most of the elements related to oxygen systems and protective equipment such as suits and helmets before the final decision had been made. This dispute between what type of suit finally came to a head during a pre-development conference hosted by Lockheed for the A-12. Going in, the CIA was on the side of using a fully pressurized suit. They had conferred with Brigadier General Donald D. Flickinger, who had worked on the U-2 program and was one of the CIA's top advisors around this time when it came to the physiological aspects associated with these types of crafts. Kelly Johnson, one of the lead Lockheed designers on the project, felt otherwise, believing that a full pressurized suit was too heavy and would just be a hindrance. A discussion was held between Kelly Johnson, Joe Ruzikas, a representative from David Clark, as well as representatives from Firewell and the CIA. Evidently believing the discussion was going nowhere, Rusikas went to get up and leave, but was stopped by the CIA representative, who then quite bluntly stated the full pressure suit route was going to be the one they took. This discussion ultimately helped with the production and efficiency of the plane overall, as it was easier to create a pressurized suit than an entirely pressurized cabin. In addition, it was calculated that for every pound, or 0.45 kilograms of weight removed, the craft was able to go up one foot, or 0.3 meters in elevation, so every little bit helped. So the cockpit would not be in Insulated, meaning that the suit had to do most of the work protecting the pilot. And so not long after, work began, and the David Clark Company was contracted directly to make the suit, rather than being subcontracted by Firewell. Because of this, Firewell was then able to focus more on the oxygen and pressure elements, such as the suit pressure controls, breathing regulators, and oxygen system. Come early 1961, the first prototype was made, the S-901 Flying Outfit Full Pressure High Altitude Multilayer Suit. The primary requirements of the suit alone was that it needed to provide protection from the hot temperatures the cockpit may face, changes in pressure brought on by high altitude and the rapid onset of heat, wind, and eventual freezing temperatures in the event the pilot needed to eject. 
These suits were based off ones that had come before it, such as the MC-2, a suit made for the X-15, the world's first space plane, as well as the AP-22S series of suits, which were being developed for non-top secret Air Force projects and operations. Now, one of the interesting and sometimes confusing aspects about these suits was what they were called. Neither the Air Force nor CIA ever gave them official designations or names. They were simply referred to by the David Clark Company's model numbers, which oftentimes covered various parts and elements of suits and other components, some of which were not even associated with the same project. Anyway though, the first suit was ordered on March 7, 1960 and was made specifically for Captain Harry Collins, who was to be the one to test out the suit before full production on them began. Due to ongoing research, feedback, and development associated with the program, quite a number of changes were seen to the S-901 over its lifetime. From things as small as changing neck ring latches, the device used to connect the helmet to the suit, from single to double, to things as large as adding flotation bladders and knife pockets, as well as the removal of aluminized fabric on the outside, there were quite a number of versions. All in all, before the suit actually reached a completed point, it had gone through at least 12 major versions, with the initial ones gaining an additional number, sometimes two. For example, the S901-2 or S970-5-3. Not only that, the S901 series would also include the addition of a letter. So for example, S901B, C, and so on. This mixed with the various modifications and models being made for the A-12 as well as the YF-12, an interceptor fighter based on the design of the A-12 that was being tested in the early 60s as well, led to quite a bit of concurrent usage of different suits during the same time periods. But the final large-scale version as far as suits for the A-12 go was called the S-901H, which became the primary one for Oxcart in 1965 and saw quite a bit of changes to it compared to the original S-901. So let's actually take a look at the general components that made up most of the suits. Though features vary between versions, suits generally were comprised of an underlayer. Though not technically part of the suits, these were essentially a base, usually in the form of olive green or white long johns, that added a bit of comfort for the wearer. An inner suit, sometimes referred to as the gas container layer, these were basically a garment made up of a waterproof material that inflated when under pressure. These went from the wearer's toes all the way up to their neck and were the main component of the suit as far as environmental systems go, as it had most of the connection points for other pieces such as the helmet, gloves, and communication systems. Versions up until H were noticeably different as far as entry method. Earlier suits utilized what was called a U-entry method, which saw a zipper start at the front of one shoulder, then go down around the back, and then up to the front of the other shoulder. The H model simply took that zipper and oriented it horizontally along the back, allowing for a much quicker and easier process. Above that was the restraint layer, used to support and prevent ruptures of the pressurized section. They too appeared to have had similar entry methods, i.e. the U versus vertical rear. On top of all this was the outer suit, which is what you usually see in most photos. Initial versions were made of an aluminized Nomex fabric, then referred to as HT1, but were eventually replaced with matte white polyester based fabric, known as Dacron, as the aluminum finish would cause reflections and glares for the pilots. The Dacron fabric stopped this problem but did not offer the same amount of protection against fire, and so it had to be backed with HT-1, which added a little to the suit's overall weight. This layer was also the toughest, as it was the exterior portion, which would face all the elements and interactions with the cockpit, and in worst case scenario, atmosphere. At some point, these also featured a patch that was sewn onto one of the arms, which highlighted the steps a pilot needed to perform in the event of a bailout. Much of the earlier versions of all these layers were custom made for the wearers, but as stated earlier, the later models were made in 12 sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large, with each of those sizes offering a short, regular, or long versions as well. Next up was the helmet, which featured a clear plexiglass, acrylic, and later on glass visor that incorporated a conductive gold layer which allowed for defogging, but often caused a bit of reflection. Additionally, a tinted shade visor with a gesture knob for it on the side was seen, and a built-in headset and microphone, which were attached on the face seal. In addition to being connected by the latch rings, they also featured a form of cable that held the helmet down when the suit was inflated. These were made in three sizes and allowed a bit of adjustment for the crown. Now onto the gloves. Available in 12 sizes, they were connected by way of a mechanical metal ring. These included a neoprene bladder with the same restraint material found in the middle section of the suit. The outer gloves were connected by way of zipper and included various fabric, such as black leather on the palm side, as well as nylon on the back, a stretchy material known as Helenka for the knuckle section, and finally the same Nomex as the rest of the exterior suit for the remaining area. They also featured internal components referred to as brake bars. These allowed the gloves to become clenched after the 
suit was pressurized by way of the black straps on the outside. Finally were the boots. Primarily constructed of soft white leather in seven different sizes, they looked a bit like US combat boots of the time, though made a bit bigger so they could fit over the inner section. On the front was an easy on-off zipper, which was surrounded by adjustable laces. Connected to these by a series of straps were a specialty set of metal spurs. They would be connected to the bottom of the A12 seats for the purpose of keeping the pilot's legs secure in the event they needed to eject. The total cost for one of these suits? Usually around 30,000 US dollars. Now, for the sake of covering all bases, here is a very brief rundown of all the alphabetized suits. The original S901 was the base model used, though not solely to develop all future S series suits. The S901A saw the replacement of dual neck latch rings to a single one and saw the most amount of insulation under the cover, which was decreased in all future suits. The S901B went back to dual neck latch rings and replaced a back biomedical fitting with a pad. It remains a bit of a mystery as far as reasons for its development. The S901C kept this single neck latch ring and also added a double slide fastener. The S901D switched brands of the neck rings and updated the forearm disconnect as well as communications components. The S901E was one of the most modified of the versions as it overhauled many aspects and was the first suit to ditch the long name of Flying Outfit Full Pressure High Altitude Multilayer Suit, which was replaced with the much easier Pilot's Protective Assembly. This would become the first large scale use suit, though it was still tailored to each of the wearers. The S901F, used primarily for the YF-12 series of aircraft, saw the restraint layer's leg section modified for improved comfort, as well as the removal of knife and watch pockets. They were the first in the S-series to gain general size options for the wearers. The S901G was mostly the same as the F, but has been considered as a custom-type suit for wearers who didn't exactly fit into any of the general 12 sizes seen with it. The S901H was the most commonly seen suit. Being the main replacement of the E as the general suit of the A-12, it took a bit more influence from another family of suits and saw the main way of entry change from a U-style to a simpler back vertical zipper. Additionally, the restraint layer had adjustment cords on it instead of laces, and it adjusted elements of the venting system. Later versions would also add a urine collection system and finally completely do away with the aluminum exterior for a non-reflective white one, which appears to have been intermittently used with an assortment of previous models as well. There appears to be no I model, as in many industries when assigning numbers, I is skipped over as it too closely resembles the number one. After this is where things get vastly different as the next suit was referred to as the S970. The overall look and functionality of it appears to be based off the S901H, but according to David Clark, it was based off the Model G, with one of the biggest changes being the addition of an integrated flotation system. Finally is the S901J, which is the odd one out, as it was not directly associated with the A12, but rather YF12. However, it would see major use as the go-to suit associated with the SR-71 project that spawned from Oxcart, albeit in a modified manner, though that is another story. Now again, these were just some of the larger changes seen between versions. Because of the secrecy surrounding Oxcart, the lack of information, and just passage of time, covering every single variant of each version in great detail would be next to impossible. Anyway though, by the end of the 1960s, Project Oxcart was on its way out and was eventually cancelled. The A-12 project and its suits were rather short lived, yet extensive, though proved vital in the US's development of high-speed reconnaissance aircraft. The S-901 series, when looked at with just the A-12 in mind, doesn't seem like much, but when viewed with a larger perspective, proved to be vital in the development of future fully pressurized suits, such as the S-1030, which eventually replaced all SR-71 and U-2 suits, as well as the advanced crew escape suit used by space shuttle crews towards the mid-1990s. With so few made in general, today even fewer of the S-901s still survive and can be found in a few different museums and exhibitions, with very little making their way into the collector's market. Well, a bit of a doozy this one. Hopefully it was enjoyable and something of a refreshing break compared to what we traditionally cover on the channel. Again, we didn't go too much into the actual A-12, so if you want to learn more about that and the entire history surrounding the project, check out the video Pilot Photog did on it. As always, be sure to like and subscribe, or just check back real soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.